thanks for inviting me. Thanks to the university and the museum, of course, for bringing me here and having a chance to uh, speak about some of the things that have kept me busy over, over the last years. Um, I've been, uh, or my background is uh, coming from more than a art historian and film studies background. I've been studying in Berlin at the Free University and uh, I kind of didn't even start in art uh, in the first place, but my, my real beginnings are in theater and performance myself. I started there and uh, was working a lot with Odin Theater at a certain point in Denmark, which uh, was kind of a key uh, experience for me to also have been working on stage myself and uh, the idea of physicality and uh, dealing with space already started back then uh, to give me a certain uh, context in which I was becoming more and more interested in. So in my own writings, uh, that was always a kind of key thing uh, to deal with. Um, I started in the 90s uh, when I was uh, living in Berlin, and I still am living in Berlin, to address the topic of film and architecture, which was something that I thought at this point was quite, kind of very crucial to think about in the city of Berlin, undergoing a lot of changes, spatial changes, uh, thinking about its own image, image, the image of the city of Berlin and how it changed its own face and how it's uh, tried to create an image and to critically uh, address this this dynamic that started and the discussions that started around it, or the discussions that did not start around it, because politicians were quite keen on developing in a certain image of Berlin, forgetting about maybe the people that were living in the city. And uh, that brought me to a kind of interest in artistic or artist films that dealt with specific topics in terms of how to relate to space, how to challenge space, how to rethink uh, the potential of space, and which then lead, was leading me to an, uh, my own dissertation which um, was focusing more on um, how we perceive space through color. In experimental film, uh, which uh, at a certain point shifted more away from the film and uh, was more kind of like perception theory uh, debate at a certain point. And I think I will try to address in the second part, which will be more going into some free thoughts about like, you know, how the question of color uh, is maybe something that's keeping me still very interested and uh, is uh, making me th rethink certain strate strategies of artists, um, which will be, as I said, the second part maybe of, of this talk. Um, so as I'm stepping a little away from my, my, uh, the concept of the lecture. Uh, it's, I'm, not, I'm trying not to be too linear in my own thoughts to like, you know, invite you to share these thoughts uh, with me uh, where, where I'm coming from. Uh, and we'll start with more maybe more, a more general question, uh, which I uh, had to deal with the question of like how to deal with images at a certain point uh, and what to, deal, to do in the dynamics that we have been experiencing all uh, together, I think, over the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, so um, the question uh, that uh, it has been one of the most prominent arguments of uh, how we uh, how we and our perception and the attention changed intensely through an increasing uh, amount of information and specifically images uh, that was established through of course like the turn of the digital dynamics and um, this this grow uh, this growth of the digital visual worlds uh, as of course, like as you all know, I'm quite sure that you're familiar with it, like having this background all in photography and how we deal with images has fostered new thoughts on the impact of data and specifically about the impact of images and how, how we try to deal with it. Um, and it, it's, it is f when I started to, to think, uh, rethink uh, how, how people, uh, like, you know, how artists are using or try to uh, connect with this art position, in, in their art positions with the question of the image, it w I found it really interesting that uh, more recently there was a kind of resonating momentum to the beginning of the 19th and 20th century. Uh, and uh, specifically that uh, in that period, uh, the question how our, our artists dealt with the ways of perception and the, that brought well, the period that brought to life, of course, the moving image. Uh, and um, on, on the other hand, is quite specific in today's uh, <coughs> uh, dynamic 
Well, uh, there's a certain, uh, certain uh, specificity about this, of course, 1920s discourse about how, how to deal with this kind of new images and the impact of these new images. But uh, also there are, of course, like when we relate it to this position of nowadays, there are huge, huge distinctions and differences. But for me, it was important to see what actually was a com combining fact when I was looking at these two periods. And I thought, oh, it's, it's quite interesting that the, the main point seems to be attention. Uh, the upcoming new dynamics of uh, new images, uh, more images, the impact of movement, uh, and how that kind of has a, had a resonance when we look at the debates and uh, the critical debates about more and more images coming to life at this moment. So that this impact uh, also, and again, challenges our ways of how do we uh, uh, deal with this um, in, in terms of attention. So, as I say, it's hard to compare the irritation of the montage of a film in the 1920s, of course, with the world of internet streams, music, video, and worlds of PR today. Um, but as I said, it's interesting to acknowledge that this development and the idea of attention is now becoming, again, in a, part, uh, a specific uh, focus of interest. And I think we need, we need to, uh, to stick with this idea for a certain moment. So in a constantly growing and, uh, emo uh, a growing and emotionally as well as spatially moving stream of data, it is highly important to understand where one's attention is actively pointed towards or passively attracted by. So when we think about this, it's important to reconsider this, this two dynamics, passive attention and active attention. How are, like, you know, for instance, things fostered through images and are attacking us and how are we shaping like actively where I actually want to look at? You know, this is kind of a, a thing that uh, leads through, um, through, I think, a lot of discussions at this moment. And furthermore, and with a clear understanding of these two modes of attention, is actually, it has to be a diagnosed that attention has become a key value uh, in our society and almost comparable to money. So there have been a few publications, uh, for instance, from uh, Georg Frank, who actually says that, like, you know, at, at a certain point, we have to see that that's actually dealing with this new, uh, new dynamics of attention, or we have to understand that as a kind of value in our society. And in so, and in so far, the density of the stream of images we find in music videos, video games, the net, uh, net streams uh, has created a reality that it continuously sets new tasks for our apparatus of perception. It is a mode of feeling being thrown into a visual, visual particle cell accelerator. And I think it's exactly this kind of feel that we like, or think are quite commonly, or, or we have to acknowledge maybe, uh, that uh, results uh, at, at one part, maybe in, in the younger generation, a certain uh, way of, oh, that's what I have, have to deal with, and I have quite an experience of dealing with this kind of stream of images. And then maybe, not generally speaking, but in an older generation, in this kind of rejection mode. This, uh, and that's also not too new, because like when, when I consider, like, you know, when, when I was showing my grandmother for the first time a video, movie video, uh, uh, a video, a music video clip, she couldn't see anything. So it was like, I can't see anything, and I was rejecting that, and there was a kind of immediacy in a kind of technophobia. So I don't know this, so I have to reject this. But that's one side of this kind of uh, question, dealing with this kind of uh, challenge of attention. At the same time, this split, uh, split screen, multiple la sound layers, and multiple text information come along with images, and it's um, not self-evident that this audiovisual attacks something that's called augmented, or we can address as augmented reality in other fields, uh, can be accurately digested. So, and uh, maybe we, we can be reminded of a uh, kind of critique that the Situationist International, of course, uh, was already establishing, saying, like, you know, we need to consider how these Im images are like a constant flow of spectacle, and we need to criticize this. On the other side, it is remarkable that specifically the questions of augmented reality in the way of training, perception, and attentiveness, attentiveness are key fields of uh, research for, of course, economy, PR companies, science, and most of all, of course, like questions that are uh, dealt with in, con the con in the military context. So here, apart from the aspects to make the f body function better, so a kind of efficiency question, the main interests seem to be a new economy of attention or by embedding additional information into images, the maximization of utilization. 
So um, the perfection of how our body functions and how what we could add by training ourselves. And uh, I think this tendency does not just result in a continuous exploration of the limitations that the human perception undoubtedly has, it also leads to new fields of interest concerning the image and its form. And it's exactly here that I think that in, over the last few years, there has been a shift in terms of uh, thinking about this, what the image, how we deal with the images. There has been a new interest in specific segments of, of, or like aspects of the, uh, of the image, namely, for instance, aspects like color, sound, something that I would call haptic vibration. Uh, there are things that became rediscovered potentials for further dynamics and uh, like for fields like in the art context. Um, but there should be, of course, no doubt about it that also this segment in the arts is, can be understood as partially being reason um, or partially being embedded in an, in, in an uh, interest uh, that is part of the industrial and commercial world. So even if it looks like new galvanize, a new, like a new galvanizing of forms, uh, which often inspire uh, uh, or in, are inspired or are used by uh, artists in different dynamics. The goal of these forms is to playfully maximize of often the, uh, the layers of information and in the images and to bend and expand the capacities of decoding the information. So we are part of a kind of like, you know, learning, uh, learning by seeing this kind of new images and uh, learning to deal with this intensities. So against the backdrop of this development, various questions I think are concerning uh, how we deal and relate to images are, uh, or visually, uh, or the visual data are arising. Questions like, how do we cr create an, a, a way of orientation? How do we relate to an idea of images? How do we altern alternatively use them? Or how can we reflect our own modes of functioning through and with image data and constantly changing, increasing image-based environments? So these questions have been crucial, not just in relation to the commercial development, but as I said, generally are at stake, as we can see at the recent theoretical debates. Uh, and the image debate is not the question around, that subsumes all around this debate about the uh, pictorial turn. I think it are quite, uh, uh, show that quite, quite uh, good in the last few years. Um, <clears throat> and like, of course, like discussing artistic practices. Especially artists that work with installations, the use of images are key. Uh, in, uh, um, for especially for artists that work with installations, the use of images are key, become a key element that seem per, perpetually addressing these kind of questions. So this aspect, uh, this is because apart from unveiling the new status of the image and the importance of the new source attention, they are largely confronted with another question and can't, that can't be overlooked, and an addition, uh, which is an additional force in this discourse and has a huge impact in our ways of thinking with and about images. And this force is, of course, space. But what seems so self-evident for us, I think, uh, that space is always kind of, of course, related to the, to the image and its politics that come along with it, um, I found it interesting that, that there has been, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this aspect has been kind of like not so acknowledged in the way that it, it should be, uh, and, and even in the pictorial turn debate. The complexity of the relation between images and space becomes clear when you walk, of course, through the image-based installations that has been, have been flooding the museums in the last 20 years. And not, not just like the photography installations, but also, of course, uh, the filmic installations. There's the aspect of the space represented in, then we, we understand that there's the aspect of the space represented in an image, the space of the cadrage, the space of the projection, and furthermore, the architectural space of the installation and its relation to concepts like interior, exterior, the public, and the private space. So, as, of course, like as early as 1982 in his essay on questions of other spaces, Michel Foucault remarked on the trend whereby the topos of space had become one of the fundament, for him, one of the fundamental thought categories uh, of the present moment and was increasingly determining the philosophical and aesthetic discourse. 
And I think against this, we have to uh, see like how, how the question, when it is addressed by Foucault, the question of, of space, how that also became very important in terms of uh, you, you, the use, like you know, readdressing certain questions in the artistic field. Since the, uh, then, the discussion surrounding the category of space and its impact on images had constantly increased. One of the and, uh, and on the on the negative side effect, one of the negative side effects in this development was the consequence of space and the understanding of what space is was f uh, fluctuating all the more rapidly between a more general quotidian banalities and on the other side, very, very specific micro concepts. Like, you know, this, is really, this, means that this concept of space means that for the specific artwork. On the other side, there's like, you know, this tendency to more generally not only talk about atmospheres, the atmospheric space, which didn't grasp anything at all anymore. In the light of this development, it seems paramount to remember that the arts since the 1960s are, but, uh, repeatedly refined the engagement with space and the conditions of its production. So questions of space came into view that focused on the form inherent to the artwork, as did questions that emphasized the reference of the site and its presentation. In 1967, Robert Smithson, for example, addressed the question of the architectural organizing structure of the museum and uh, went on to discuss the fundamental question, what is a museum, with Alan Capro. And uh, just as a kind of... Smaller hint to this, uh, the reference point to clarify what the institutional framework for images for, for other artworks is. Uh, they were debating what actually the potential is and if it may, might not be um, a negative dynamic. The critical approaches according to which the museum and its forms is demonstrably more of, is, is one more of a grave than a structure conducive to a discourse of space. So it would be expanded in the course of the 1970s and 80s, particularly with regard to the social and political processes by artists such as Hans Hake, Marcel Brothaas, Daniel Burin, Michael Escher, Greg Bordowitz, and Andrea Fraser. Another. So what we see, we see the, the sculptures that are directly address the question, uh, are addressing the question of space, but uh, what, what they try to put in, dynamic, uh, in a certain dynamic is of course the question of the role of the museum and how that is a kind of like, you know, there's a necessity to reflect on, on the impact of that space and how we perceive certain images or like artworks in this con kind of context. Um, uh, <clears throat> the same is of course like well, I mentioned her already, Andrea Fraser Museum highlights a gallery talk. Um, uh, tries to also like continue this, this, this challenge of the museum and the perception of artworks or like images in this context, uh, in this specific uh, work. M museum highlights a gallery talk where she's of course like operating or performing, uh, doing a performance as, uh, as a guide in the museum and uh, <clears throat> starting from uh, explaining in a very classical way of course like what uh, people are seeing on certain images or what like in certain uh, other sculptures mean and how we have to understand them and while she's walking on in the museum she turns to certain toilets and uh, like you know of course addresses certain toilets as certain artworks which of course are not part of the artwork show but like driving a certain absurdity it's like guide, a guided tour that completely went bananas um, <clears throat> of course like by doing that, critically pointing out how this space is actually focusing, uh, adjusting our ways of looking at art and how we understand certain images and uh, how they are used in a certain context. Um, and of course, that's a kind of uh, thing that we have to see against the backdrop of the de uh, against the backdrop of developments of the museum, uh, where aspects such as the, the process of the free market economies and group dynamics entered the foreground. The questions of uh, of the concrete spatial conditions of the museum, the museum as apparatus, um, uh, to a certain ex by that uh, to a certain extent fell from view. So uh, I think, uh, which is interesting, if you, if you reconnect the whole debate, for instance, to something that starts kind of parallel in the end 1960s, we see that in the cinema as well, where, for instance, the situation is, of course, like start to address how the cinema um, should be said, like, you know, challenged as a kind of institution uh, that uh, shapes our ways of looking at moving images and uh, we need to readdress it by leaving, for instance, the cinema by uh, um, 
disturbing the, the constant process of projecting images, for instance, as a suggestion. And in so far, we have to understand, of course, and this kind of history in terms of how we look at images in museums is also something that needs to be uh, um, reflected. However, the particular in, connect, uh, how, particular in connection with the sharply increased presence uh, since the 1990s of image installations, digital photography, light boxes, film videos, uh, and film installations, the museum, the topic of space would go on to demand renewed attention. So seeing this, that how, how of course, like, you know, the space was used differently and increased by artists that, like, you know, working with... Uh, photographic installations, uh, there's a new maybe discussion arising from that. Uh, the potential of the uh, image appears everywhere, disturbed, uh, uh, dist distributed to monitors, to projection screens on the floor and the ceiling, and no longer has to be perceived by a frontally oriented seated audience. So the mode of contemplation has changed in the museum as well. Instead, it became increasingly necessary to walk through the installation and to enter into the relationship of space, pictorial space, and viewer while in motion. So the movement uh, is getting more complex, of course. It becomes apparent that this transformation was not only essential with regard to, the film, and f to film and photography, but also signified a gain uh, for thought in the indicated categories of space, pictorial space, and viewer. It was now possible to recognize the interdependency that in the past uh, had not often revealed itself. Not only does it appear that space is determined by the gaze of the viewer, but, but space likewise appears as a determiner of the gaze and thus exposed, exposes what Martin Seel in his context of his investigations of possible other ways of looking at the world revealed as a constant oscillation between determining and self-determining. So it is something where I have to like th rethink, like not uh, I'm not just only shaping what I see, but like you know that was is, uh, is like you know uh, an opposition to me, like the image also is shaping my ways of of looking, and of course the environment plays a key role in this, like namely the museum or the cinema. In this way, image space nearly becomes an active entity that no longer only reflects what is cast onto it by the human spectator, but instead we have to understand space and image as an agent, an inter something that is like becoming active. That, that world, <clears throat> or more precise, an image confronts the subject and, is, equi uh, and uh, is equipped with such a potential, however, shakes the foundations of our accustomed modes of thinking. And it is interesting to observe that although the idea um, is actually connected with a transformation that has developed partially rapidly in the course of the 20th century from thinking in terms of statically absolute spaces and bodies to, and bodies, to thinking in terms of a dynamically, a dynamic relational spaces. This idea, idea nevertheless continues to be deeply unsettling. So we are still, I think, uh, in this mode where we consider there's something on the opposite side of me and I'm the perceiver. Well, like, you know, the dynamic, the, uh, the question of how this spatial relationship has become way more dynamic. Uh, and I think that's actually the point uh, where it becomes interesting, uh, where I wanted to turn to a more free talk from my side to uh, the question of color. Because uh, when I was uh, coming to this point and, and rethinking the, the potential of the image, and uh, as I said before, uh, what, what it means in terms of this bipolar uh, connection, there's the image and there's, there's myself, and uh, the dynamics that have been uh, 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 um, rising since the last 20 years, um, for me, it personally became very important to re uh, look at images again, and specifically the potential of color, because uh, it seemed to me that there in color, uh, there was something that uh, Jonathan Crary, for instance, in his book, uh, Techniques of, of the Observer, mentions uh, that is deeply uh, showing us how a certain way of, uh, that there's a certain different way of maybe experiencing something in an image. So, uh, seeing color for him, that's when, when he starts, is something that uh, uh, has always this impact of uh, 
like you know, you're uh, bringing to life your own personal specific uh, technical apparatus. So the life of after images, uh, when we look at something and all of a sudden I see, a, uh, like my eyes are seeing something that is colorized and you know, it's like there is no color in this. So that makes clearly kind of like su subjective impact or clarifies a certain subjective impact that comes from my side of, of like, you know, the whole story between me and the image. And uh, starting from this, he, he uh, goes further and, and says, well, there is a certain uh, potential in this, uh, and the potential is always, of course, co quite closely connected to to the subjectivity, which, of course, like was something that discredited not only color in relation to to the image, but it was like discrediting color to a certain extent very generally in philo in philosophy. So when you you can also go, go back at least to Kant and say like you know how is Kant referring uh, uh, in the context uh, of his own philosophy to to the color as a kind of potential for perceiving space, and he says uh, it's something that is like uh, too intense. There's like this connotation with it's it's too much. Uh, you have to reduce uh, if you use color, you only should use it to a certain extent in in paintings, for for instance, but also like you know, we should always be very aware of how much uh, you generally uh, approach color by yourself, uh, and uh, and that is of course like something that's completely opposite the other other concept is for for him the line, uh, and we when when we rethink this, uh, the line being also very much connected to the concept of the perspective. We construct perspectives. We see in certain images, always we are searching when we see spaces, we're always searching for a certain perspectival space. And uh, color opens this other, like, you know, Pandora's box, so to speak. Uh, what, what does it mean, actually, when it is too much, too intense? Uh, and uh, when you go through a certain scientific approach over the following years until the beginning of the 20th century or you can see that it's exactly um, this this kind of potential for spatial experience that uh, that uh, opens up uh, uh, this, oh, that is opened up by the use of color so when I was thinking about that and thinking about like you know my own approach to the film it, to uh, to film the film images in the first place and there's always this myth of of course, early cinema having been black and white, and of course, like you know, when you look at newer research, you figure that uh, specifically in early cinema, almost 80% of the images have been uh, colorized. Uh, um, <clears throat> that becomes a certain uh, dynamic effect, uh, or has a certain uh, dynamic where you think like, okay, you have the at one, you have the spatial experience of of the moving image. Which becomes a kind of certain in, 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 uh, gets into a certain intensity, and is a kind of challenge to our ways of like you know in the in, in the beginning of the 20th century to our ways of attending uh, of following these images with attention, and then you have a certain dynamics that comes out of color that has a kind of comparable intensity. Um, while I was doing this kind of research, and it's like important, we see here ha like this kind of colorizations that is still applied to a certain object. We have still a kind of uh, of course, the perspectival space slightly changes when we look at this other, like you know, tinting and toning processes that are also quite common in this early early cinema phase. Um, uh, because I mean, it's about really like coloring the whole impact of a whole of a whole scene. So it's also it's not only the space that we see, but it's like you know, the color itself becomes a certain um, uh, a, a certain spectacle. And uh, as you can see here, it's like, you know, uh, it also shifts away from quite uh, traditional uh, connotations when we see uh, Denmark and snow or uh, the North Pole in like orange and red colorizations. It shifts away from the classical symbolical connotations. Uh, we see that like, you know, that this kind of, there is something, uh, even though it's, uh, we see a perspectival space, there is a certain intensity that comes along, along with that. And this kind of like was for me, uh, becoming very important and understanding what actually happens there. Uh, there is, uh, it's not about, uh, you know, for instance, as we can see here, exoticizing certain, uh, certain areas and certain spaces and think about them, as we can see here with what Pate also does, like when he's uh, doing this kind of theories and the uh, colorization of the Orient, but it becomes a kind of phenomenon that's a kind of very direct experience um, of the space of the cinema and the filmic space, so to speak. 
Uh, here again, like we have uh, the color pretty much sticking to like you know the physicality and the stage and the object, but as we see here, uh, it is like you know to be imagined as a kind of like spatial. It's kind of imitating Loe Fuller's dance, uh, light experiences. But of course, it's not imitating it like as it was in the theater. But it becomes to a certain spatial experience, a new spatial experience through this way of presenting color and using color in this dark room, namely the cinema, um, um, as, uh, as a new form. Of course, artists were picking up on this, on this kind of dynamics, as I think. Uh, <clears throat> we see this kind of abstract wax experiments from Oscar Fischinger uh, uh, some, some 20 years later. And it's, here, here it's becoming more evident, like that's not about the, like, you know, color sticking to a certain object, color sticking to a certain framework and it's related to a certain perspective. It's not like, you know, um, a kind of under, uh, like, you know, uh, lower category that is used in a certain kind of perspectival context, but it becomes really a, like, you know, a, 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 an aspect of space and of spatial experience by itself. And uh, it's, when we look at, like, you know, the, 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 like, the theory critics at that point, uh, namely, for instance, Bela Balash, uh, Siegfried Krakauer, and Walter Benjamin. It becomes very interesting how most of most of them, I mean, Krakauer uh, and Balash, uh, were quite quite clear on this. Uh, that that, that uh, they were picking up the same argument, basically, that that Kant was already establishing. Color should not be used like that because it has the tendency to create a too intense spatial experience. Once you start this to have this kind of spatial experience, you would like you know have the tendency to not you, you know, would not be capable of like going out of this experience again. So that was a kind of like that's why color should uh, still not not be used like it was used and now in some of these experiments, but very clearly and controlled. Uh, when you look at Walter Benjamin at the same time. I think it's it's very interesting uh, that he brings uh, bring, brings up a certain other potential, and he's starting a like specifically in the twenties a whole book on color that he never finishes, um, and um, he's he's like discovering for himself I think something that is also very closely linked to what he's writing in his artwork uh, essay, um, where specifically in the last part he's he's a, Personally, addressing the question of what is this new medium doing? What is it like? You know, what's the potential of the new, new medium? And uh, in which kind of state of crisis are we nowadays? So he uh, he is speaking about like uh, the, the question of the intense uh, uh, field of uh, like you know what it, what it challenges our attention, and says in this kind of situations of crisis, and that's actually a. Uh, an argument that Jonathan Crary is picking up and also relating to this new time, like now to, to the now uh, and the digital dynamics. In this kind of crisis, the body always responds to the physical or like the, the visual impact by using other senses. And namely for him, the, the dimension of the haptic becomes more and more important. So we, we have to, in, case, in, in the case that our visual apparatus is not capable of perceiving what we see in front of it, we are all of a sudden undergoing a process of resensitation. We have to rely and we are starting to hear differently, touch differently, and specifically touching and like using our eyes almost as, as a kind of like hand that goes over the image. Uh, becomes quite important. <clears throat> and, well, in, in another article, uh, Benjamin expands that, and, and, I mean, then, if you understand that, uh, what it means to use, for instance, color and not being able when it's, like, having that spatial impact and comes out of an image and moves towards you, moves into you, at a certain moment you can't make this distinction between me and the world anymore. So that's actually the thing when you understand why uh, Immanuel Kant had to like keep up this distinction. Like, you know, there's the world, there am I. I have to rationally relate to it. I have to keep the world in a certain distance, while color is always tending to let this kind of distinction break together. So and that's where I thought, like, you know, this is kind of uh, interesting to follow up on, and because it 
challenges our perception apparatus and asks us to relate with a resensitation to the world in a new way. I had some other examples that are just like, you know, if you follow this, this train of thought, uh, you can, of course, see how Fischinger is uh, proceeding with this idea. You can see that later in films of Breckage and even follow the, the dynamics into the mainstream film when you have this kind of spatial experiences in, in uh, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 where he closely collaborates with the artist Jordan Belson who of course like, you know, has been wor working for almost 20 or 30 years at that point on the question how to use color and create spatial experiences like in experimental film. And that is for me the point where I stopped from my, from my uh, <clears throat> from my PhD and said, okay, this is uh, the, the context I go on. We go to, until 1969. I didn't move further into the now, but uh, I still, the, the, the context and the, in, the interest for me still uh, is quite, quite intense. And I've been working lately specifically with, uh, with works um, or like been writing about some of the works and one of the one that I found con really interesting in this context and maybe in the context of a r film relating to of course like historic images and photography was Runa Islam's uh, emergence where she's trying to use of course like the new like or the newer medium or like the high-end digital medium uh, and, re and related to uh, the glass negative that she found and uh, what it also means to use color in a certain dynamic and, the pro and address the process of developing uh, an image. So i just shortly show this. That's it. That's it. Um, so, I mean, you have to to uh, understand that it's like usually, of course, it's a, a high HD projection, pretty big, so that we couldn't do this here now, this context, and then, uh, of course, in a dark, completely dark room. Um, but, I mean, you, I think you understand, like you know, picking up the ideas there, or like in you know, the question of like having a spatial experience, standing in a room with this kind of like red intensity, of course traces back to something that I was talking earlier uh, before, or like uh, about before but at the same time um, what I found interesting is it's of course also opening up the gap between like of course the HD question or like the, the digital question uh, of, of the now to this, uh, this other process but of course like still s addressing the question like how, how is the question of color still like you know in both fields one that is uh, kind of uh, stays for a continuation and we have to see and experience this always in a new way. Uh, that being <clears throat> what, what has been shown and, and specifically I mean the question of like you know how important is the motive uh, by like you know going through this whole process of like you know becoming to the point where it would be okay to take it out of the, of the, of the bath 
and then leaving it in and then uh, letting the image exactly dissolve into the other direction. Uh, so it's, a, it's not about the actual object. Well, to a certain extent it is because you know, she also like, points out the glass negative. Uh, but even more it's about the process that we are involved in. Uh, what's the process of the image? What is my process? What is the process of an experience in a space? Um, and the other one, like, you know, maybe that, that is the last example from my side that was like, you know, in a, is in a certain way maybe a comparable to that and which was one of the most interesting experiences in last year's Venice Biennial, I think, is uh, The Enclave by Richard Moss. Um, <clears throat> uh, who, of course, I mean, I mean, I'm sure most of you will uh, know some of these images or th some images of this project where he's actually working with infrared film um, that when he uses it in that way because of the chlorophyll in the, in the plants, that, uh, in the landscape that he was shooting it, was tinting uh, huge parts of the landscape uh, in this kind of intense pinkish red, uh, which of course is, is an irritation by itself in terms of landscape art, like photography. Um, but I found it interesting to, to follow his ideas about this because he was also like, you know, he's known for also being uh, in the field of documentary photography, but also getting very frustrated with the established modes of documentary photography. And like by re rethinking what actually could be a challenge to our way of looking new at things and what he thinks is, is a kind of absolutely necess necessity at this moment, how could we readdress questions of uh, like for instance crisis photography and like you know really s start to see again and not uh, stay in the same patterns that we are used to uh, this mode of colorization for him uh, seems to be the right mode or the right way so I have some of the images here I also and I have a short sequence where he's also talking about but uh, just wanted to show you, because it's, the photographs is one thing, the, 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 the filmic installation is the other, and the combination of these, like, you know, first you went through a huge part that was photography, and then in Venice you were entering kind of very complex um, film installation where you were de basically sinking into this kind of pinkish colorization, and it was very, very sur kind of surreal experience, and which uh, was... was was so intense in a way of rethinking what actually happened, but uh, uh, re-evaluated in a certain way what actually the image could become and how we, like you know, see certain uh, certain social scenarios in a re uh, again in a way that is not cliché-matic. So for me, that was kind of like point where uh, <clears throat> I saw that this kind of question concerning color, spatial perception how we relate, like, you know, this kind of, like, this, this, this movement that color makes through space, how that uh, can also, like, in a certain way uh, <clears throat> be understood as kind of movement and being moved, like, in an emotional way. <clears throat> i just show you some... Well, we um, to bring that to a place, which also... It was a metaphor to do, of course, but it was, in my mind, it was a way of so trying to bring these two things together and just see... Yeah, it was a little much talking, but I think it was worth seeing the installation and some of the, the stills that have been then combined in this <coughs> installation in Venice, and to and also hear how he also like you know I think for for me it was important also to hear him say how that like challenging the ways of pers like producing the image and also perceiving the image and what kind of role color in this kind of context and have a special orientation maybe could play uh, were quite key and like that's basically what I wanted to address. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <clears throat> So now I'm up for grilling. <laughs> no, no, I wanted to uh, uh, open up the, the possibilities for questions and uh, challenges, critique. <laughs> Any questions? I, I, I was so happy to see the, that the last video because I have seen a few of those Moses works, but I have to say that 
I didn't get the point before. I was just mm. like looking at them like a nice decorative and, and just like wondering what, what what is the origin of the of the colors and but now once 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 seeing their if he's he's using filter uh, infrared he's using infrared, infrared film stock film it's film yeah. in, in infra, infrared yeah. film film which is which which explains the, the colors I it's like a very strange that somehow somehow. Uh, because of that disorientation of alienation, some, somehow now I'm I'm looking those pictures to be like more real mm -hmm. than actually the, the pictures with real colors in a yeah. in, in a way. And, and I, that's the question of, of of attention somehow. What what you was talking talking about in yeah. the very beginning, I guess. Yeah, I think it becomes for me it becomes quite clear when I when I saw them the, like this kind of like you know these images about like you know Ocris looking at that specific. Place and like this region of crisis. I mean, there has been, have been, there is, are constantly so many images are produced that function mm -hmm. in the same way, and we don't see anything anymore. All of a sudden, by using this kind of intensity for a topic, for something where it's crucially to mm -hmm. to understand, to re, re reflect and understand what it means to look different and what what mm -hmm. how hard it is yeah. to experience this new approach and how color at this point is, is shifting us quite easily to this where we're looking yeah. at it's like you know oh, of all colors pink yeah. which is of course you know for a lot of people a disturbing like you know how could you use pink you know it's like of all colors you know but like that's yeah. a kind of momentum which which creates a certain way we can look at it that like landscape photography or landscape mm -hmm. film which is also quite uncommon to have this kind of colorizations yeah. but in a like in a very paradox way as you say I mean I see more as I see usually, and uh, because I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm still like going back and forth, like you know, what am I seeing? How am I seeing this? And that's why I was so happy. Also, like when I when I was listening to that that take where he's speaking about this moment of disturb like disturbance, disorientation, as a kind of necessity, as in the first place, and color cre can create this because it mm. it dis connects from a regular mode of perception that I'm going with on an everyday basis. And I, once I understand that, maybe I can't keep that kind of topic in that kind of used distance. It comes closer. It pushes towards me. It's really a physical momentum. And it's like when you stand in front of the, I mean, the, 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 the photography that he uses in the first rooms, it's pretty, it's, it's big, it's huge, it's, nice, it's uh, over, uh, like, it's, it's higher than I am. So it's like, oh, usually it's like, you know, you immerse into a kind of, into a kind of red space. It's like, you know, the, the image starts to surround you because it pushes quite hard uh, from, away from the wall and you sink into this. So that's what I said, maybe, maybe that's also uh, uh, readdressing this question of, <clears throat> you can't take, you can't step away from it and look at it from a certain distance because it, it, it comes towards you. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe the thing where you think like, you know, that's why there was so much critique maybe or what the potential of color saying that it sucks you in. Mm -hmm. It creates yeah. a certain, certain closeness where you can't say, oh, that's the problem of the world, but I am here. Mm -hmm. If that collapses, your way you have to rethink and think like you know maybe the other way of orienting yourself is more a, the ones, a, a, a way of orienting haptically, like by touching, not literally touching the, yeah. <laughs> for, for, for the photo. Time, for, 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 for a long time, the color was like a problem for the photographic art actually, actually because you you couldn't cons consider the photographic art to be color, like color for photography, like. Mm -hmm. You, if you go in, in Finland, for example, if you go back back to the mid '80s, it was a, it was still a, all all black and white what mm -hmm. we had, just like late late '80s, the color appear. Mm. What was interesting for me also, like in terms of talk or like talking about this kind of war photography or like crisis mm -hmm. photography, uh, I, I was coming across a, a, a kind of this was a smaller debate actually, uh, right after World War II, where there was. Uh, a, uh, it was actually uh, an American discussion where they were looking at the photo like the film stock that was shot by the Russians uh, going into Germany and uh, how they how they were like documenting their way of falling into Germany or like approaching Germany and heading towards Berlin and at the same time the same was done of course by the Allied forces but mainly by the Americans the Americans shot in <clears throat> in color 
the Russians in black and white. The whole discussion was about how staged the American thing was, but ba basically they had just the camera and were going on while the Russians were actually invading and partially if the shot wasn't good enough, they were falling back and shooting again, <laughs> which was like they were doing the same attack again just like for having the right images. Well, I thought like so much for staging and color, which is like, of course a certain <laughs> absurdity. Like, well, I thought, like what is that kind of discussion that we're having? But of course, like they use color, it's staged, it's more like, you know, that's Hollywood. <laughs> 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 nice, nice point. <laughs> yeah. Nice point. Two, two wars. Yeah. How about that? as a curator, have you noticed that uh, this kind of uh, way of using more, or let's say, new colors in, in the in the photography and film is is it that increasingly coming more and more popular, or what is your yeah, I think there's certain other awareness in the in the last years. I mean, you know that here at the school, I mean, you have some good examples of people working with color and having a certain tradition of readdressing this. Uh, and specifically here, I found like the dealing with certain sc scales, like it was certain scale of photography and and how <clears throat> how certain uh, colorization is used is something that resonated with specifically this kind of crisis with the digital image and the discussion that turned like you know was surrounding this I thought like you know if if there is this stream of images and like the question is like is it's permanently there so how are we relating how are we dealing with the spectacle while at the same time we of course know that the use of like color color in PR and like in PR and advertisement and it's kind of part of this kind of con constant spectacle momentum so, specifically there, I had the feeling this this reapproaching the what color actually what the potential of color can be like you know, and where where it com where it comes from. I thought like you know this is the kind of thing that I uh, I see more and more. And um, open. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, for me. It's like the new dynamic that comes along with this, this aspect of resensitization, having a capability to understand what it actually means, and uh, stepping out of this purely visual dynamics that come along with it. I mean, it's not not. Uh, I mean, it's not so, not so much a surprise that questions of synesthesia, for instance, come up again, which have been, of course, like a huge debate in the beginning from the like you know like from the 19th to the 20th century until the mid 20s, where like you know while it was like you know related to as a kind of or like referred to as a disease in the very beginning, by the 1920s you were completely sick if you didn't have it, you know, <laughs> it's just like you know it was like you know if Ar when Argelander or some of the other um, uh, uh, philosophers and, and, and medic, medics write about synesthesia, it is already that established that it's think like, you know, oh, you don't know about synesthesia. And then it completely disappears again. It's interesting that at a certain point the whole color debate fades away. Yeah. And then there's this whole topos about what is documentary, how necessary is black and white, how is it like, you know, like, you know, this, how the, what's the critical apparatus that comes along with it and it's like more true to the real thing. Basically, sticking in line with the argument that all we all see also in the whole discussions in the 20s from Balash, Krakauer. I think that they're picking up on the same thing. And David Bachelor, I mean, still in the 1990s, he writes this book on chromophobia. You know, it's like, okay. <laughs> From chromophobia, somehow I, I think that's in the in the beginning of talking about spaces and and museum spaces, and I mm -hmm. think that in a, in large, large scale, if you go into the to the museums, it's like all you have there. It's like like the white walls and empty spaces, spaces and that mm -hmm. white white cube. We mm -hmm. have that chromophobic mm -hmm. <laughs> approach in, in in terms of the museum spaces. Mm -hmm. Of course, but that's like you know tracing back to a certain, of course, institutional politics mm. that like you know because I mean it, it's, it's, yeah. it has not been the rule forever. No. So it, is, it comes along with a certain change in modernism, a certain yeah. different approach that establishes exactly the white wall as yeah. the so-called neutral space. Well, we can mm. discuss how much how neutral white is. Yeah. 
No, uh, and but if you go for instance in different concepts of earlier museums, of course, yeah. like you have the, they have the, the, the fabric that is always uh, has, has different colorizations, where you have, uh, have a following order, where you go from a green room to the more pinkish room to mm -hmm. the uh, like dark violet room to the green room again to the blue room, yeah. uh, which is a certain f colorization yeah. of the whole space, and mm -hmm. in this colored space you see oil paintings, mm -hmm. which is of course all of a sudden. You, it becomes very clear that this kind of spatial colorized, colorized dynamics was key yeah. before. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to say that I, I don't know too much about your curatorial uh, work, but the, mm. but uh, in um, in in case of like a, a curatorial work, what, what what do you think about the, the use of the museum space? So how how do you are approaching <coughs> spaces when when working as a, as a curator? As, well, you, as you are so aware of the, 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 the discussions, like uh, what was the, the example you show, show about that? Well, one of the key artist. things for me, of course, in the, in the last few years was, since my background, or like one of my backgrounds is in f like dealing with film, film installations, yeah. was a huge frustration in terms of like up from a very low until a very high stand, standard uh, um, established positions in curatorial practice. Almost none of them had a kind of any any sensitivity in terms of film installations. Mm -hmm. Where I thought, like you know, I don't know how, how they could like present two film works next to each other while not thinking about that one of both both films have sounds. Mm -hmm. And I thought, like you know, well, it would be the same if I think about this oil painting and hanging it over the other oil painting. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, it was, uh, everybody would be completely going mad, you know, saying like, you know, you can't hang the Picasso over the Brock. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like, you know, you know, interesting way of relating to this, you know, it would be yeah. completely irresponsible. Mm -hmm. But with, with film, you can, it seems that like, you know, that you can easily do that, you know, oh, you, but you see the images. I thought like, you know, yeah, well, okay, until, the, until this problem is not solved, I think there's not really an acceptance of, film, of the filmic image in the museum. So we have to still relate to this and readdress this topos. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of the experiences. From my own practice, I usually, when I work, I try to involve the, in, like the positions, the artist positions as, as much as I can mm -hmm. and, and really do something precisely uh, in connection with the environment and the actual architectural setup. Mm -hmm. So that's a key, key thing. And also uh, <clears throat> challenge maybe the way of addressing uh, what the institutional impact of the museum is generally. Like you know, the last, one of the last exhibitions that I was doing was with Lawrence Wiener and Carl André and it was in a yoga studio. So for them it was quite interesting. I said like, "Wow, that's quite crazy." You know, but I've never thought about like presenting my work in a yoga studio, but like you know, <laughs> let's see what's happening. And it was very interesting to have a Carl Andre like you know, a uh, nineteen element line um, metal grid on the on the on the ground floor and people doing yoga next to it. Okay. <laughs> okay. We, we have a museum yoga at our museum. So Which is, <laughs> let's see. So this leads to, that. <laughs> so that leads to that. It leads to that. <clears throat> yeah. any, no. any, any other questions, like comments? One artist that for me deals like, in a very interesting way with space and with color is James Tarrell. Have you worked with him before? Yes. I mean, I didn't work with him personally, but of course he was quite important for my own PhD. So it was like, of course, like this, how, how he like, creates this kind of light spaces. And you know, like that's. Kind of our <coughs> like we, we see something that is mm -hmm. not there, or we actually <coughs> find out that there is something we don't see. Yeah. And all this achieved like, yeah. by color. Yeah. Like yeah. It was important. Uh, I can uh, say it so much. I didn't. Mm, there was not. I didn't want to address that. But for my PhD, it was important to, s at a certain moment when I was thinking about color and this specific moment, uh, color in, in experimental or in film in general. Uh, was trying to trace back two traditions. Usually, like, you know, the, this whole film debate is kind of closely linked to a certain art historic approach. So we have an image, and then we have, before the moving image, we have the photographic image, and then we have the oil painting, which is, I think, quite insane to do something like that, because we have certain dynamics that are completely 
um, ignored when we do something like that. Because for me, uh, uh, in my PhD, what I try to pronounce is that there are two lines, actually. Like, we can, of course, trace back the question of what, how is color used in the kind of, kind of idea of the image. Like, and then we can go back to oil painting and how, how it is used. But the other tradition, of course, is one that traces back to colored light spaces, which namely go back to the cathedral. And it's kind of completely different. And that's where then you have these two lines. And at, at a certain point, they, they merge. And, and um, they have precursors, of course. You have all these light organs that people play on organs and do synesthesia concerts where they try to like, you know, illuminate the space with different colors. And uh, have, you have the fusion of the sound of, and the color as this kind of like floating experience in space, like I'm swirling around in music and in colors which is kind of like a kind of precursor to what then later happens maybe also in the cinema. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I've never been thinking about that before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like many of us, I guess. Just one comment uh, that you mentioned, Turel, that, uh, that maybe you saw the exhibition of his in, in Wolfsburg mm -hmm. a few years ago, and mm -hmm. uh, there was one, this one big Mm -hmm. space which was only about the question of color and space together mm -hmm. and there was nothing else mm -hmm. and that that's maybe the most the biggest experiment for me in, mm -hmm. in the art field yeah. yeah. you, you couldn't go away from there yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so it was an example of having space and color yeah together it's and quite, i think it's an experience is quite profound yeah and we're not used to this kind of like we always get kind of like cautious or like oh, is it okay that I'm like you know reacting that intensely to this kind of that I have this kind of experience and I mean like you know another thing that comes to my mind which was of course very uh, important in the very beginning when I started was of course Derek Jarman's Blue so if you sit like you know for like you know 60 70 minutes in a in a dark space and only look at a blue image and then step out of the cinema and then you have for at least 10 to 15 minutes an orange after image in your own eyes and you see oh I've never seen the city like that orange it's like you know a very interesting spatial experience <laughs> that you can undergo there which is amazing you know it's like and uh, I mean the, the I mean the the cynical or like the, the sad thing about it is when he was finishing it I mean of course he was almost blind it's like um, addressing this, what it means to, to get blind and what the capacity of seeing the world and seeing it every day new could, could mean. If no other questions, I, I guess it's time to thank Mark. Yes. Mm -hmm.